okay. In 1882, the Parliament in Westminster passed the first act to preserve ancient monuments in Britain. A short schedule was drawn up listing the key items of our, natural, our national heritage. Scotland contributed 35 items to stand alongside places like Stonehenge. These included showstoppers like Maysow and the Druston Stone at St. Vigens, Angus. So that shows what level of art we're looking at here. In 2009, uh, Historic Environment Scotland created an exciting and informative museum where the Droston Stone and its many companions found in the church and churchyard at St. Vigens by Arbroath are safely preserved and displayed. The museum is now closed, except for special bookings due to lack of staff and visitors. This image of the road sign to the museum is my only political statement. A <laughs> tiny bit of advertising would help to boost visitor numbers, as it is a very secret location uh, in the suburbs of our growth and quite hard to find. Gosh, it does run around, yes. The stone had first come to public attention when Patrick Chalmers published his elephantine tome on the sculptured monuments of Angus in 1848. Thereafter, antiquaries pounced on the enigmatic inscription, hoping it would be the Rosetta Stone unlocking the secrets of the Pictish language. There are at least 67 articles about the inscription, but actually nobody has written about the art which speaks equally eloquently, but in a visual language. Andrew Gervais summed up the problem in 1872, and he said, on this stone are rudely shaped uncouth <coughs> figures of man and beast, together with strange instruments, which have defied all our hieroglyphicists to construe. <laughs> it, in this lecture, I want to take up that challenge set by Gervais, and try to unpick some of the immense cultural information which the stone displays. It provides art historical clues which go a long way to compensate for the lack of indigenous documents about the Picts. I propose to examine the design and cultural signals on each face of the stone. I shall draw parallels between the way the inscription is constructed and the intellectual background of the sculpture, showing that both aspects reflect the hybrid qualities which created the later manifestations of Pictish art in the 9th century. I do not have time to examine the role of the stone within its churchyard setting, but will give you a glimpse of that intriguing story at the end. Um, so, on the front there is a cross full of interlace, and around the cross are a load of monsters. On the back, is a big hunting scene with uh, Pictish symbols. And on one side, there's a vine scroll. And on the other side is more interlace and the inscription. So those are the elements that we're going to be looking at. Thomas Clancy is the most recent scholar to examine the linguistic implications of the inscription. It consists of three names, which I'm sure you can actually read. We don't need 87 articles about it. Droston, Uret, and Forcus. We do not know who they are, although both kings and saints bore these names in Pictish times. The alphabet is Roman, the script is a generic half insular, half uncial, and the names, uh, two of the names, occur in a Pictish form, Droston and Uret, while Forcus appears in an old Irish form. If et means and, and is in probably Latin, it may be a spelling error, Whereas Ipe and, uh, or Ire presents a problem for anyone, nobody's really understood what that means. In passing, we may notice that the inscription is not particularly confident or accomplished. It doesn't even fill up the panel properly. And the lower line of its frame is incised twice, uh, and the lettering is not particularly stately or even. It's therefore possible that the literate sculptor who added the lettering was not the same person who carved the rest of the stone with considerable confidence and an emphatic hand. As a slab type, Drostens belong to the group which Isabel Henderson classifies as later. It is relatively tall and narrow and has decorations down the sides, a feature which she sees as um, a Pictish reaction to the freestanding crosses being produced at Dalriada in Northumbria in the later 8th and early 9th centuries. 
Now I'm going to embark on looking at it under five headings. The naturalistic figures, the monsters, the vine scroll, the symbols, and lastly the interlace, where results have caused me some surprise. The aim is to explain both where the artistic ideas came from and what they might have signified to the patron and the viewer. Animals on the Droston stone appear to derive from two types of source. The naturalistic animals are a traditional part of the Pictish stone repertoire, but the monsters are all derived from manuscript models, which appear as a fresh injection of new ideas, but fitting comfortably with a Pictish love of creating hybrid creatures. All the naturalistic animals on the back of the stone can be paralleled with other Pictish sculpture, from the common stag hunt with hounds and bird of prey to the bear, hare, hind and fawn, eagle and salmon. On the busy scene at Shandwick, uh, there are remarkable similarities with the prancing stag and the kneeling cowled archer. At Latheron, uh, there's an incised eagle with his talons in the salmon. The scene of the suckling fawn and doe is matched by the tender parents licking their calf at Tarbot. On the hunt scene at Elgin, a hound is also placed above the stag's head. Uh, un an unusual feature of the St. Vigian stag chase is actually the lack of a hunter. But on the other hand, we've got that man down at the bottom uh, with his bow and arrow, and we've got the symbols in the middle, which might represent a person. Many of these forms uh, derive from the earlier class one inside symbol stones, so the salmon, the eagle, bull, boar, stag and bear are all found on Pictish, uh, earlier Pictish symbol stones. My book analyses in detail the meaning of all these animals within insular society. Uh, and so I'm not going to go into the great detail of them here. But two points can be made briefly about the general hunting theme. Irish texts like the Lays of Fionn emphasise that hunting is not simply about the kill. It is about comradeship, courage and shared male bonding activities like the subsequent feasting, the power, the skills and trust shared between the Lord and his men. However, noble hunting, so crucial in heroic tribal society, was being tamed into a Christian courtly ritual whereby pivotal sacred events like royal baptisms and weddings were accompanied by hunting and feasting, which were included, which, at which the clergy were included and bonded men of God with the war bands. These Christian hunting activities were particularly uh, carrying, being carried out in the, Carolin, in the Carolingian era uh, and written down in panegyrics, which were intended to be spread out to other courts for emulation. So on a stone like this, the hunt sits very comfortably beside the cross. Unlike the naturalistic animals, whose designs evolve from the traditional repertoire of Pictish sculpture, all the monsters on the front and back of the Pictish stone come from manuscript sources. Far from being a display of unfettered imagination, the entire menagerie on this stone is deeply informed by classical learning. The monster's identity will first be defined through Pliny's encyclopedic account of the natural history. And I must say, that's about 15 volumes long, and I did start reading them, and then I found all these beasties in one book, uh, which was fantastic. So, according to Pliny, um, the Yale on the back, who you can see there, according to Pliny, uh, the Yale on the back is the size of a hippopotamus with an elephant's tail of black or tawny colour with the jaws of a boar and movable horns more than a cubit in length. <laughs> Although this carving has only one horn, its double jawline is indeed made in exactly the same way as the boar on the same face. On the front, starting on the right, the entwined serpents down at the bottom, says Pliny, usually roam in couples, male and female, and only live with their consort. The entwined beasts on the upper left uh, are a serpent biting the tail of a large quadruped with a ridged body. This is likely to be the ichneumon, or asp, who engages in a death struggle with the crocodile, who is a curse on four legs, 
who has talents and the hide invincible against all blows. So that's a struggle <coughs> between a, a serpent and a crocodile. Pliny mentions satires, half men, half beast, living in Ethiopia. And although he doesn't describe them specifically, satires were recognised in Greek mythology as being small, hairy, often priapic men with goat's legs, horns, long ears, a tail. And that's a fair approximation of the exhibitionist imp up at the top of the stone. Um, the, the creatures with fins on his back, reminiscent of a stegosaurus, may be an interpretation of the catoblepus, who is of moderate size and inactive with the rest of its limbs, only with a very heavy head, which it carries with difficulty. It's always hanging down on the ground. Otherwise, it is deadly to the human race, as all who see it uh, expire immediately. <laughs> the panther, says Pliny, um, is of the tiger family, and all animals are frightened by the savage appearance of its head. You can see that quite clearly. The winged lizard-like creature on the bottom, uh, on the bottom left there, shares many features with Pliny's chameleon. Its shape and size is like a lizard, with a snout not unlike a pig's, considering its small size. It has a very long tail that tapers towards the end and curls into coils like a viper and has crooked talons. Pliny, in fact, provides the complete cast for the Drosten stone, defining both the natural and the hybrid animals. At Jaro, in the 8th century, Pliny's natural history was familiar and available to Bede, who cites it 86 times. One can therefore suggest that a copy of Pliny was available at St. Vigens too, or else the ideas were tr transmitted through learned com communication from Northumbrian clerics. As with so many other features on the Drosten stone, Northumbria seems to have provided the conduit for this selection of animals in Angus. Now looking at the sources of the pictures, the prancing Yale on the back is in every respect except his horn, the lion symbol of St. John in the Book of Durrow. Many of the manuscript parallel parallels that I'm going to cite belong to the so-called Tiberius group, produced at debatable locations south of the Humber under Mercian influence in the mid to the late 8th century. So here, the elongated splayed-out creatures on the left and top right on the front are found in the Stockholm Codex Arius. If you see in the manuscript there, you've got these splayed out, spatchcocked creatures. Um, the taut, prowling panther and chameleon are found in the column of a canon table on the Cutberg Gospels. The exhibitionist imp, delicately described by Alan as an angel query, <laughs> is, <laughs> is found in the column of a canon table in the Barberini Gospels. And where we see these creatures show that the power of the cross is keeping these menacing animals of darkness at bay. Plant ornaments are, really, are relatively rare in Pictland. Isabel Henderson lists only 20 examples of vine scroll, six of which are from St Andrews. And at St Vigens, it is only found on Droston stone and uh, on one side and on one other, one other example. Um, vine scroll on the same monument as a group of symbols is a very rare combination, which we find at Hilton of Cadwall and Tarbot I. Vine scroll combined with an inscription, however, has been noted as a feature of Anglo-Saxon sculpture at Ruthwell, Bewcastle, Carlisle and Dewsbury, and is found elsewhere in Pictland, at Duplin and Creef. In other words, vine scroll and literacy, namely the Latin language or Roman alphabet, often go together. The vine scroll at um, Droston Stone is rather flat and heavy, with uh, tendrils, lanceolate tendrils, coming out from the sides of spirals and crossing over the adjacent uh, stem. And the fruit on them are three round pellets, which are the grapes, growing upwards. Note the grapes are growing upward. Um, we have on it a tiny little otter uh, eating some of that fruit, and that is very common in, in certain aspects of Northumbrian sculpture, where you can see at Ruthwell, for instance, the animals actually eating the fruit on the inhabited scroll. But the lower part of the scroll is uninhabited, and that is found, again, all over Northumbria. And the cross shaft at Lowther uh, it provides a veritable pattern book for varieties of simple S scrolls, 
with flower with the um, pelleted uh, grapes. And the Lauda cross is dated by Cramp to the late 8th, early 9th century. Vine scroll, originally a Roman import but well established in Northumbria, is a priestly addition to the iconography. It adds the concepts of Christ, I am the vine, the Last Supper, and the priest's performance of the Eucharist. Inhabited by eager little animals, it adds the participation of the congregation to that communion. Now I'm coming on to the symbols. <coughs> Beneath the stag hunt, there is a double disc and zedrod, crescent, mirror, and cone. We also have the bowman at the bottom of the slab and three inscribed names. There are only two surviving symbol stones where, uh, which are combined with symbols and Latin inscriptions, and that is Droston Stone and Fordun. It therefore appears that the memorial monuments generally required either symbols or lettering, but not both. And the Droston Stone is therefore on the cusp of that transition. Is there therefore a connection between the identity expressed by the symbols and that of the, of the inscription? Might the symbols relate to Droston, Urit, and Forcus? Well, we don't know. <laughs> if only this ex coexistence of both types of designation on one monument could have turned Drostons into the Rosetta Stone, where you've got multiple languages saying the same thing. We might actually be seeing that, but of course we can't actually nail it. The double disc and Zedrod has two exceptional features. The rod at the top points to the left, and the discs are filled with knots. Although Romilly Allen named this symbol double disc with Z-shaped rod, in most examples the rods face to the right, like the letter S. Rods facing left form distinct groups. Some are on the most primitive and possibly oldest symbols, for instance in the Weems Caves and at Dunny Care. Um, but the second group comprises items of the highest status, where one would expect a patron to have given great care over the correct execution of that symbol. In this group are the Norris Law silver plaque, the white clue terminal ring from a chain, and the bronze crescent from Law's money feath, um, another one on uh, St. Vigens, and the Droston stone. So in contrast to the symbols in the caves, those on the metalwork and the Droston stone are immaculately executed, the tweak of the Zedrod individualized with the precision of a general's campaign medals. The reason for the shared symbols on the three pieces of metalwork is not known, but Laws, where the crescent breastplate is found, is in the parish of Monifeith, only about 17 kilometers south of St. Vigens. The patron of the Droston stone had a reason for choosing to represent his identity in this way, and he might have owned or used as a model precious metalwork of a similar design. The other unusual feature of the double disc is its filling with the fourfold interlaced knot. Double discs are normally filled with circles, spirals, and arcs, as you can see, or meander patterns, as you can see on the, the crescent, a fundamentally Celtic repertoire. There are only two survivings of a double disc symbol filled with interlace representing an Anglo-Saxon art form penetrating a Pictish design, the Droston Stone and Edsel. And I'll come back to Edsel. There's a reason to suspect that these two are related and their connections are going to be explored later. I now want to explain how the interlace uh, has its own story to tell, and this is what took me a bit by surprise. Um, it seems that there are three ways in which interlaced designs are generated. The first comes from a master carver who fully understands the geometric logic and grid pattern which underpins all the designs. He can create any type of virtuoso pattern to fill the required space. The second comes from a stock in trade, a limited repertoire of patterns which circulate through a district, taught from master to apprentice, which generate a regional spectrum of common designs. But the third is an exotic pattern chosen for its meaningful association with another site or object. In contrast to most of the other examples of St. Vigens, which have <coughs> echoes all over Eastern Scotland and all the other interlace in St. Vigens, the interlace on the Droston stone exceptionally has many far-flung parallels in sites of particular significance. When looking at the grey patterns of stone today, 
it's worth remembering that their strands would have been far more vivid and easier to read originally. Uh, there is ample evidence at Port Mahomet, where the stones were destroyed relatively soon after their manufacture, that they were, in fact, coloured. So, this fourfold knot, very unusually, occurs on two monuments on the site at St. Vigens, the Drosten Stone and the Great Freestanding Cross Number 9. On both these monuments, the location of the knot is prominent within the discs on the double disc symbol and covering the massive boss on the cross ring. Romilly Allen identified one other sculpture only with this design, and that was on the south side of the cross at Terman Fechin, County Louth in Ireland. Now Terman Fechin is actually means St Fechin's Sanctuary in Ireland. It would be satisfying to explain a direct connection between these two occurrences, because St Fechin is the Irish saint whose name is translated into St Vigin in Pictish. Uh, I mean, that's more than a coincidence. But the evidence is more complicated. It is also found in the letter N of the Book of Durrow and in Northumberland on the Acliffe Cross, County Durham. It is likely that other examples of this knot will be located elsewhere, but the current distribution in Ireland and Northumbria may have a direct significance for Droston Stone. Uh, in Scotland, there is only one known example, other known example of this knot, and it's located um, as at St. Vigens within that double disc. It is found in the crudely designed cross slab at the old church of Edsel in Angus. The carving may be 10th or 11th century, much later than Droston Stone. Edsel Church itself was dedicated to St. Lawrence, but it is in the vicinity of St. Droston's final retreat. The 16th century Aberdeen Breviary describes how the saint spent his early life in Ireland, but eventually retired to become a hermit living in Glen Esk. He is commemor commemorated nearby in Taffside with a place named Drusty's Meadow and a boulder there carved with an incised cross. In 1662, the nearby New Dusk Church and Parish were annexed with Edsel and New Dusk Church was dedicated to St. Droston, with St. Droston's Well just east of the churchyard. Although Thomas Clancy is rightly hesitant in identifying St. Droston on our Droston stone, uh, it could well be that at the North Est congregation at some later date, wishing to commemorate their local saint, had made this link with the badge at St. Vigens. The long panels of interlace on the Droston stone are also unusual in Pictland. The majority of uh, interlace on face B, which is what you see here, is covered in pairs of asymmetrical knots facing outwards and upwards, which is called pattern number 658. Uh, this pattern belongs to a Northumbrian group, twice at Abercorn, West Lothian, Durham Cathedral, and an unknown province, provenance, the Dales. So, that pattern is St. Vigens and Northumbria. The primary site, uh, so that's on one side, the, the primary site uh, for the interlace is on the face of the cross. On the cross shaft, there are groups of four asymmetrical loops pointing inwards. I probably have to point this out. You've got these loops pointing, four loops pointing inwards, and they create a shape of a cross in the void which you can see spelt out here more clearly. Four loops pointing inwards and a cross in the void. So just fix on that. Um, uh, Alan does, does, and that pattern is called 647. Romilly Allen does not cite any other Scottish examples of pattern 647. It's unusual at St. Vigens. Therefore, there are a number of different ways, uh, but there are a number of different ways to create the effect of crosses in the void formed by loops pointing inwards. So, here's another way of making a very similar pattern, which is called um, 638. And you can see on the left, 638 has got that cross in the void, four loops pointing inwards. It makes very little difference to the viewer, what they're actually seeing, but it makes a huge difference to the designer, who's dealing with a different number of strands. 
So I would tend to visually equate those two, two types of crosses, oh, loops pointing inwards forming cross in the void uh, with each other. And if we can then run with 638, uh, we suddenly have a big family of, of stones with that same pattern. And that distribution forms a coherent group. At St Oswald's Cross, Durham, Durham 5 and 6, Chester Le Street, Jarrow, Hexham. The void is formed uh, where the four loops meet, producing an outline with splayed arms, like St Cuthbert's pectoral cross, which you see down there. Um, and the shape of the cross itself, of the St Vigian's cross itself, is very remin reminiscent of the cross which was carved onto the coffin lid of Cuthbert's coffin. So Cuthbert's cross and his coffin lid are both actually being shown on that cross at St Vigian's. Uh, this choice of the patterns, uh, let, just on this face alone, shows that there's likely to have been some affiliation to St Cuthbert, both due to the form that we see and the distribution of other items which share that form. The patterns on face A, B and C, uh, the knot, the um, two sets of, of interlaced patterns, all relate to a Northumbrian cluster. St Oswald's Cross, Durham, Chester the Street, Acliffe, and all these are connected to the community of St Cuthbert, which you see on the bottom right there, all of that group. Their dates are argued around the late 9th to early 11th century, i.e. later than our stone and Rosemary Cramp refers to their extraordinarily old-fashioned appearance. And she convincingly explains that this is a sign of deference to one stone cross which the Cuthbert community valued above all others. And this was the cross, look, top left, this was the cross carved at Lindisfarne for Bishop Ethelwald before he died in 740. It was the earliest recorded freestanding cross at Lindisfarne, and it included the inscription of his name, interlace and inscription. The monks treasured it so greatly that they carried this great stone monument along with Cuthbert's coffin throughout their journeys across Northumbria, finally erecting it at Durham Cathedral, so you can see why its pattern spread. Crabbe considers this cross served as a model for much of the subsequent carving associated with the Cuthbert community. These comparisons therefore indicate that all three major components of the interlace on the Drosten stone, the cross, the side panel, and the fourfold knot, plus the location of the inscription low down, derive from a Northumbrian source, which is likely to be St. Ethelwald, Bishop Ethelwald's cross at Lindisfarne. For a short period, we have evidence that Pictish rulers showed particular devotion to the cult of, of St. Cuthbert. <coughs> Oopsie. In the Durham Liber Vitae, the great patrons of the community are recorded for, for perpetuity. And they, that <coughs> Durham Liber Vitae includes the names written in gold of three Pictish kings, <coughs> Unst, Custatin, and Ewan. St. Cuthbert's monks were praying for their salvation for perpetuity. The international standing of these kings is such that Custantin follows immediately after Carlos, which is Charlemagne, actually on that list. They are right up there with the biggest patrons in Europe. These three kings in the Durham Liber Vitae can be identified with Constantine and his nephew Ewan um, and, uh, and Unst. Although Unst is assumed to be the 8th century king of that name, in this context he does seem likely to be the brother of Constantine and the father of Ewan. And Briggs, who's analysed all these names, notices that in the Liber Vitae, they're very often linked with familial connections or political groupings, and that's what we have here. And what we can see here, then, in the Durham Liber Vitae, three Pictish kings, very much close in date, venerating St Cuthbert, and the one who's missing, unfortunately, from that family group is Drosten, son of Constantin, if only he was there, uh, but he's not. But what this does tell us is that Dros King Drosten's family were all crazy about St Cuthbert and were doing things in his honour. And Drosten, if he's just listening to the family chit-chat, would hear an awful lot about St Cuthbert back home. It would allow King Constantine, King Drosten, to know all about St Cuthbert, 
but also have his own allegiance and be interested in the Irish St. Fechin, St. Vigen. Uh, I'm not at any point saying that we're looking at King Justin here, but it's a possibility that is a certain, there's certainly an evidence that the royal connections to Lindisfarne are very prominent on this stone. Um, this cluster of Pictish kings provides evidence of close devotional ties to Northumbria in the early part of the 9th century, perhaps sending clergy to Northumbria to pay their dues, or even visiting Lindisfarne themselves and seeing the cross. Um, yeah, there's no uh, conflict of interest in seeing the cult of St. Vigen at the church, the Irish church, and the use of Northumbrian items uh, in the design of the cross, because that's precisely what insular art does. It brings together items from all around the insular world. So my conclusion is that the design of Droston Stone seems to be a product of collaboration between a Pictish patron with secular tastes, an informed ecclesiastic, and a local Pictish sculptor familiar with Northumbrian art. A strongly aristocratic and secular statement is made on the back of the slab, framed between an exhilarating stag hunt and tense feet of, tense feet of courage on the boar hunt, are the emphatically ornamented symbols and relatively peaceful display of other animals, signs of lordly domination. It is not known why the Zedrod faces to the left, but comparisons for this unusual appearance provide high status connections to valuable, portable, and highly personal art items of metalwork. The design of the monsters reveals inspiration from classical texts and perhaps a model related to the Marcian Tiberius group of manuscripts. Whereas the vine scroll reveals a generic link to Northumbrian motifs, the interlace is far more specific focusing on that group of monuments connected to the cult of uh, St. Cuthbert, Bishop Ethelwald, and Lindisfarne. The choice of knot within the double disc is deliberate and personal, embedding an imported formula into the heart of a Pictish sign. Uh, its repetition on the great standing cross number nine is a further sign of its significance. Now, the 12th century description by Simeon of Durham of Bishop Ethelwald's cross gives us the best clue to what that original model looked like and why it was such an inspiration. So this is Simeon of Durham. Ethelwald it was who caused a stone cross of curious workmanship to be made and directed that his own name should be graven upon it as a memorial of himself. <coughs> it was subsequently carried about along with the body of St Cuthbert and honourably regarded by the people of Northumbria out of regard for these two holy men. So two names coming up on that one. And at the present day, it stands erect in the cemetery of the church, that is Durham, and exhibits to all who look upon it a more memorial to these two bishops. This passage mentions the importance of the cross for two people, its patron whose name was inscribed, and the saint whose relics were nearby. Now this talk has only been about the hybrid sources for the design, and I should end here. The function of the Droston Stone within its a churchyard is another chapter in the book, but I can provide a trailer. Nigel Ruckley has shown that the geology of Droston Stone matches two other key monuments at St Vigens, the most elaborate recumbent tomb and a monumental stone shrine. Unlike the other sculptures, which have a, logic, a local origin, these three objects were quarried from a superior sandstone found at Balmashana Quarry at Forfar, about 12 miles away. This means there was a powerful patron able to organise the logistics of shifting that rock for all three objects. The Droston Stone, we know, stood like a beacon of power and identity at the entrance to the churchyard, like Ethel Wallstone. One might then link the recumbent monument to a grave for that patron and the shrine to relics, presumably those of St. Virgin Fechin. But that's another story which you can read by buying my book. <laughs> <laughs>